Okay, let's do one more reading. I was going to try to go to bed, but I'm not feeling bed right now, so. Uh, section two. Perception or the thing and deception. Three. Immediate certainty does not take over the truth, for its truth is the universal, whereas certainty wants to apprehend the this. Perception, on the other hand, takes what is present to it as a universal. Just as universality is its principle in general, the immediately self-differentiating moments within perception are universal. I is a universal, and the object is a universal. That principle has arisen for us, and therefore, the way we take it in that take in perception is no longer something that just happens to us like sense certainty. On the contrary, it is logically necessitated. necessitated. With the emergence of the principle, the two moments which in their appearing merely occur also come into being, one being the movement of pointing out or the act of perceiving, the other being the same movement as a simple event or the object perceived. In essence, the object is the same as the movement. The movement is the unfolding and differentiation of the two moments, and the object is the apprehended togetherness of the moments. For us, or in itself, the universal as principle is the essence of perception, and in contrast to this abstraction, both the moments distinguished, that which perceives and that which is perceived, are the unessential. But in fact, because both are themselves the universal or the essence, both are essential. Yet since they are related to each other, as opposites, only one can be the essential moment in the relation, and the distinction of the essential and unessential moments must be shared between them. One of them, the object, defined as the simple entity in the essence regardless of whether it is perceived or not. But the act of perceiving as a movement is the essential moment, the unstable factor which can, not, which can as well be uh, as not be. 112. Oh, sorry, that wasn't three. That was 111, 112. This object must now be defined more precisely, and the definition must be developed briefly from the result that has been reached. <clears throat> the more detailed development does not belong here. <clears throat> Since the principle of the object, the universal, is in its simplicity a mediated universal, the object must express this, its nature, in its own self. This, is, this it does by showing itself to be the thing with many properties. The wealth of sense knowledge belongs to perception, not to immediate certainty, for which it was only the source of instances. For only perception contains negation, that is, difference or manifoldness within its own essence. 113. The this is, therefore, established as not this, or as something superseded, and hence not as nothing, but as a, but as a de, uh, determinate nothing, the nothing of a content, viz, of this, consequently, the sense element is still present, but not in the way it was supposed to be in the position of immediate cer certainty, not as the singular item that is meant, but as a universal or as that which will be defined as a property. Supersession exhibits its true twofold meaning, which we have seen in the negative. It is at once a negative and a preserving. Our nothing, as the nothing of the this, preserves its immediate immediacy and is itself sensuous but it is a universal immediacy being however is a universal in virtue and of its having med mediation or the negative within it when it expresses this in its immediacy it is a differentiated determinate property as a result many such properties are established simultaneously one being the negative of another since they are expressed in the simplicity of the universal, these determinacies, which are properties strictly speaking, only through the addition of a further determination, are related only to themselves. They are indifferent to one another. Each, each is on its own <sighs> and free from the others. But the simple self-identical universality is itself in turn distinct and free from these determinate properties it has. It is pure relating of self to self, or the medium in which all these determinacies are, and in which, as a simple unity, they therefore interpenetrate, but with coming into co contact with one another, 
for it is precisely through participating in this universality that they exist indifferently on their own account. This abstract universal medium, which can be called simply thinghood or pure essence, is nothing else than what here and now have proved themselves to be, viz. a simple togetherness of a plurality. But the many are, in their determinateness, simple universals themselves. This salt is a simple here, and at the same time manifold. It is white and also tart, also cubical in shape and of a specific gravity, etc. All these many properties are in a single simple here, in which, therefore, they interpenetrate. None has a different here from the others, but each is everywhere in the same here in which the others are. And at the same time, without being separated by different here's, they do not affect each other in this inter interpenetration. The whiteness does not affect the cubical shape and neither affects the tart taste, etc. On the contrary, since each is itself a simple relating of self of self to self, it leaves the others alone and is connected with them only by the indifferent also. This also is thus the pure universal itself, or the medium, the thinghood, which holds them together in this way. 114. In the relationship which has thus emerged, it is only the character of positive universality that is at the first observed and developed, that is at first first observed and developed, but a further side presents itself, which uh, must be taken into consideration, to wit, if, many, if, the, if the many determinate properties were strictly indifferent to one another, if they were simply and solely self-related, they would not be determinate, for they are only determinate in so far as they differentiate themselves from one another and relate themselves to others as to their opposites. Yet, as thus opposed to one another, they cannot be together in the simple unity of their medium, which is just as essential to them as negation. The differentiation of the properties in so far as it is not an indifferent differentiation, but is exclusive, each property negating the others thus falls outside of this simple medium. And the medium, therefore, is not merely an also, an indifferent unity, but a one as well, a unity which excludes another. The, the one is the moment of negation. It is itself quite simply a relation of self to self, and it excludes another. And it is that by which thinghood is determined as a thing. Negation is inherent in a property as a determinateness which is immediately one of the immediacy, one with the immediacy of being, an immediacy which, through this unity with negation, is universality. As a one, however, the determinateness is set free from this unity with its opposite and exists in and for itself. 115. In these moments taken together, the thing is the truth of perception is completed so far as it is necessary to develop it here. It is a an indifferent passive universality, the also of the many properties or rather matters, b negation equally simply or the one which excludes opposite properties, and c the many properties themselves, the relation of the first two moments or negation as it relates to the indifferent element and therein expands into a host of differences. The point of singular individuality in the medium of subsistence radiating, radiating forth into plurality. Insofar as these differences belong to the indifferent medium, they are themselves universal. They are related only to themselves and do not affect one another. But insofar as they belong to the negative unity, they are at the same time exclusive of other properties but they necessarily have this relationship of opposition to properties remote from there also. The sensuous universality or the immediate unity of being and the negative is thus a property only when the one and the pure universality are developed from it and differentiated from each other. And when the sensuous universality unites them, it is this relation of the universality to the pure essential moments which at last completes the thing. 116. This then is how the thing of perception is constituted, and consciousness is determined as percipient insofar as this thing is its object. It has only to take it to confine itself to a pure apprehension of it and what is thus yielded in the true. If consciousness itself did anything in taking what is given, it would by such adding or subtracting alter the truth, 
Since the object is the true and universal, the self-identical, while consciousness is alterable and unessential, it can happen that consciousness apprehends the object incorrectly and deceives itself. The percipient is aware of the possibility of the deception, for in the universality... Oh, hold on. Um, the percipient is aware of the possibility of deception, for in the universality, which is the principle, otherness itself is immediately present for him, though present as what is null and superseded. His criterion of truth is therefore self-identity, and his behavior consists in apprehending the object as self-identical. Since at the, the same time diversity is explicitly there for him, it is a connection of the diverse moments of his apprehension to one another. But if a dissimilarity makes itself felt in the course of this comparison, then this is not an untruth of the object, for this is the self-identical, but an untruth in perceiving it. 117. Let us see now what consciousness experiences in its actual perceiving. For us, this experience is already contained in the development of the object and of the attitude of consciousness toward it given just now. It is only a matter of developing the contradictions that are presently there, pre present therein. The object which I apprehend presents itself purely as a one, but I also perceive in it a property which is universal and which is thereby which it, and which thereby transcends the singularity of the object. The first being of the object as essence as a one was therefore not its true being. But since the object of what is true, the untruth falls in falls in me. My, my apprehension was not correct. On account of the universality of the property, I must rather take the objective essence to be on the whole a community. I now further perceive the property to be determinate, opposed to another and excluding it. Thus I did not in fact apprehend the objective essence correctly when I defined it as a community with others or as a continuity. On account of determinateness of the property, I must break up the continuity and posit the objective essence as a one that excludes. In the, in the broken up one, I find many such properties, which, ah, oh, gosh, dang it. There we go. Which do not affect one another, but are mutually indifferent. Therefore, I did not perceive the object correctly when I apprehended it as exclusive. On the contrary, just as previously, it was only continuity in general. So now it is a universal common medium in which many properties are present as sensuous universalities, each existing on its own account and as determinate, excluding the others. But this being so, what I perceive as the simple and the true is not also not a universal medium, but the single property by itself, which, however, as such, is neither a property nor a determinate being. For now, it is neither in a one nor connected with others. Only when it belongs to a one is it a property, and only in relation to others is it determinate. As this pure relating of itself to, uh, to itself, it remains merely sensuous being in general, since it no longer possesses the character of negativity, and the consciousness which makes its object to be a sensuous being is only my meaning, ein meinen, i.e., it has ceased altogether to perceive and has withdrawn into itself. But sensuous being and my meaning themselves pass over into perception. I am thrown back to the beginning and drawn once again into the same cycle which supersedes itself in each moment and as a whole. 118. Consciousness therefore, necessarily runs through the cycle again, but this time not in the same way as it did the first time, for it is experienced in perception that the outcome and the truth of perception is its dissolution, or is reflection out of the true and into itself. Thus it becomes quite definite for consciousness how its perceiving is essentially constituted viz. that is not a simple pure apprehension, but in its apprehension is at the same time reflected out of the true and into itself. This return of consciousness into itself, which is directed, directly mingled with the pure apprehension of the object, for this return into itself has shown itself to be, the, be essential to perception, alters the truth, 
consciousness at once recognizes this aspect as its own and takes responsibility for it. By doing so, it will obtain the true object in its purity. This being so, we have now in the sense of perception, the same has happened in the case of sense certainty. The aspect of consciousness being driven back into itself, but not in the first instance, in the sense of w in which this happened in sense certainty, i.e., not as if the truth of perception fell in consciousness. On the contrary, consciousness recognizes that it is the untruth occurring in perception that falls within it. But by this very recognition, it is able at once to supersede this untruth. It distinguishes its apprehension of the truth from the untruth of its perception, corrects this untruth, and since it undertakes to make this correction itself, the truth, qua truth of perception, falls of course within consciousness. The behavior of consciousness, which we have now to consider, is thus so constituted that consciousness no longer merely perceives, but it also uh, conscious of its reflection into itself, and separates this from simple apprehension proper. 119. At first, then I become aware of the thing as a one, and have to hold fast to it. In this its true character, if in the course of perceiving it, something turns up which contradicts it, this is also, this is to be recognized as a reflection of mine. Now, there also occur in a perception various properties which seem to be properties of the thing. But the thing is a one, and we are conscious that this diversity by which it would cease to be a one falls in us. So in point of fact, the thing is white only to our eyes, also tart to our tongue, also cubical to our touch, and so on. We get the entire diversity of these aspects, not from the thing, but from ourselves. And they fall asunder in this way for us, because the eye is quite distinct from the tongue, and so on. We are thus the universal medium in which such moments are kept apart uh, and exist on its own, though the f through the fact... Uh, water. then that we regard the characteristic of being a universal medium as our reflection. We preserve the self-identity and truth of the thing, its being a one. I'm gonna pause for a sec. Okay. All right, 119. At first, then I become aware of the thing as a one and have to hold fast to it uh, in, in this, its true character. If in the course of perceiving it, something turns up which contradicts it, this is to be recognized as a reflection of mine. Now, there also occur in the perception various properties which seem to be properties of the thing, but the thing is a one, and we are conscious that this diversity by which it would cease to be a one falls in us. So in point of fact, the thing is white only to our eyes, also tart to our tongue, also cubical to our touch, and so on. We get the entire diversity of these aspects, not from the thing, but from ourselves, and they fall asunder in this way for us, because the eye is quite distinct from the tongue, and so on. We are thus the universal medium in which such moments are kept apart and exist each on its own, <clears> through the fact <clears throat> then that we regard the characteristic of being a universal medium as our reflection. We preserve the self-identity and truth of the thing, its being a one. 120. But regarded as existing each for itself in the universal medium, these diverse aspects for which consciousness accepts responsibility are specifically determined. White is white only in opposition to black and so on, and the thing is a one precisely by being opposed to others. But it is not as a one that it excludes others from itself, for to be a one is the universal relating of self, self to self, and the fact that it is a one rather makes it like all of all the others. It is through its determinateness that the thing excludes others. Things are therefore in and for themselves determinate. They have uh, properties by which they distinguish themselves from others, since the property, Eichenschaft, is the thing's own, Eigene, property, or a determinateness in the thing itself. A thing has a number of properties, for in the first place, the thing is what is true, i.e., it possesses intrinsic being and what is in it. 
is there as the thing's essence and not on account of other things. Secondly, therefore, the, the determinate properties do not exist on account of other things and for other things, but in the thing itself. Yet they are determinate properties in it only because they are a plurality of recipro uh, reciprocally self-determining, differentiating elements. And thirdly, since this is how they are in the thinghood, i.e. the essence of the one thing of which they are properties, they exist in and for themselves, indifferent to one another. It is in truth, then, the thing itself that is white, and also cubical, also tart, and so on. In other words, the thing is the also, or the universal medium in which the many thing, many properties subsist apart from one another, without touching or cancelling one another, and when so taken, the thing is perceived as what is true. 121. Now in perceiving in this way, consciousness is at that time, or is at the time, aware that it is also reflected into itself, and that in perceiving, the opposite moment to the also turns up. But this moment is the unity of the thing with itself, a unity which excludes difference from itself. Accordingly, it is this unity which consciousness has to take upon itself, for the thing itself is the subsistence of the many diverse and independent properties. Thus we say of the thing, it is white, also cubical, and also tart, and so on. But in so far as it is white, it is not cubical, and in so far as it is cubical and also white, it is not tart, and so on. Positing these properties as a oneness is the work of consciousness alone, which therefore has to prevent them from collapsing into oneness in the thing. To this end, it brings in the insofar in this way, preserving the properties as mutually external and the thing as the also. Quite rightly, consciousness makes itself responsible for the oneness at first in such a way that uh, what was called a property is represented as free matter. The thing is in this way collect, uh, raised to the level of a genuine also, since it becomes a collection of matters, and instead of being a one, becomes merely an enclosing surface. 122. If we look back on what consciousness previously took and now takes responsibility for, on what it previously ascribed and now ascribes to the thing, we see that consciousness alternative, alternately makes itself as well as the thing into both a pure, manyless one, and into an also that revolves around itself that revolves itself into um, independent matters. Consciousness, thus, finds through this comparison that not only its truthful perceiving, Naaman de, uh, des Warren, Barin, contains the distinct moments of apprehension and withdrawal into self it, itself, but rather that the truth itself, the thing, reveals itself in this twofold way. Our experience, then, is, is this that the thing exhibits itself for the conscious apprehending it in a specific manner, but is, it is, but is at the same time reflected out of the way in which it presents itself to consciousness and back into itself. In other words, it contains in its own self an opposite truth to that which it has for the apprehending consciousness. 123. Thus consciousness has got beyond the second type of attitude in perceiving too, i.e., the one in which it takes the thing is as truly self-identical and itself for what is not self-identical, but returns back into itself out of identity. The object is now, for consciousness, this whole movement which was previously shared between the object and consciousness. The thing is a one, reflected into itself, it is for itself, but it is also for another. And moreover, it is an other on its own account, just because it is for another. Accordingly, the thing is for itself and also for another, a being that is doubly differentiated but also a one. But the oneness contradicts this diversity. Hence, consciousness would again have to assume responsibility for placing a diversity in the one and for keeping it away from the thing. It would not have to say that insofar as it is for itself, the thing, it is, the thing is not for another. 
but the oneness also belongs to the thing itself as consciousness has found by experience. The thing is essentially reflected into itself, the also, or the indifferent difference, thus falls as much within the thing as does the oneness. But since the two are different, they do not fall within the same thing, but in different things. The contradiction, which is present in the objective essence as a whole, is distributed between two objects in and for itself. The thing is self-identical, but this unity with itself is disturbed by other things. Thus the unity of the thing is preserved, and at the same time the otherness is preserved outside of the thing, as well as outside of consciousness. 124. Now, all, although it is true that the contradiction and the objective essence is, in this way, dis distributed among different things, yet the difference will, for that reason, attach to the singular separated thing it's itself. The different things are thus established as existing on their own account, and the conflict between them is so far reciprocal that each is different, not from itself, but only from the other. But each is thereby determined as being itself a different thing, and it has its essential difference in its own self, but all the while not as if this difference were an opposition in the thing itself. On the contrary, for itself it is a simpler, simple determinateness which constitutes the thing's essential character and differentiates it from others. As a matter of fact, since differentness is present in it, it is of course necess ne uh, necessarily present as an actual difference manifoldly constituted. But because the determinateness constitutes the essence of the thing by which it distinguish its, distinguishes itself from other things, and as for itself, this further manifold constitutes constitution is the unessential aspect. Consequently, the thing does indeed have a twofold insofar within its unity, but the aspects are unequal in value. As a result, this state of opposition does not develop into an actual opposition and the thing itself, but insofar as the thing through its absolute difference comes into a state of opposition, it is opposed to another thing outside of it. Of course, the further manifoldness of necessarily pre is necessarily present in the thing too. So that it cannot be left out, but it is the unessential aspect of the thing. 125. This indeterminateness, or this determinateness, which constitutes the essential character of the thing and distinguishes it from all others, is now defined in such a way that the thing is thereby in opposition to other things, but is supposed to preserve its independence in this opposition. But it is only a thing, or a one, that exists on its own account, insofar as it does not stand in this relation to others. For this relation establishes rather its continuity with others, and for it to be connected with others is to cease to exist in its, on its own account. It is just through the absolute character of the thing and its opposition that relates itself to others, and is essentially only this relating. This relation, however, is the negation of its self-subsistence, and it is really the essential property of the thing, that is, its undoing. 126. The conceptual necessity of the experience through which consciousness discovers that the thing is demolished by the very determinateness that constitutes its essence and its being for self can be summarized as follows. The thing is posited as being for itself or as the absolute negation of all otherness, therefore as purely self-related negation, but the negation that is itself is the suspension of itself. In other words, the thing has its essential being in another thing. 127. In fact, the definition of the object as it has emerged has shown itself <sighs> To contain nothing else, the object is defined as having within it an essential property which constitutes its simple being for self. But along with this simple nature, the object is also to contain diversity which, though necessary, is not to constitute its essential determinateness. This, however, is a distinction that is still only nominal. The unessential, which is none, the less supposed uh, to be necessary, cancels itself itself out 
it is what has just been called the negation of itself. 128. With this, the last insofar that ex that separated being for uh, for self from being for another falls away. On the contrary, the object is in one and the same respect of the opposite of itself. It is for itself so far as it is for another, and it is for another so far as it is for itself. It is for itself reflected into itself at one, but this for itself, uh, this reflection into itself, this being a one is posited in a unity with its opposite, with its being for another, and hence only as canceled. In other words, this being for self is just as unessential as the only aspect oh, that was supposed to be unessential, viz. the relationship to another. 129. Thus the object in its pure determinateness, or in the determinateness uh, which were supposed to constitute its essential being, is overcome just as surely as it was in its sensuous being. From a sensuous being, it turns into a universal but this universal, since it originates in the sensuous, is essentially conditioned by it. And hence, it is not truly a self-identical universality at all, but one afflicted with an opposition. For this reason, the universality splits into the extremes of singular individuality and universality into the one of the properties and the also of the free matters. These pure determinatenesses seem to express that essential nature itself, but they are only a being for itself, being for self, that is burdened with the being for another, since, however, both are essentially in a single unity. What we now have is unconditioned absolute universality. The consciousness here, for the first time, truly enters the realm of understanding. 130. Thus the singular being of sense does indeed vanish in the dialectical movement of immediate certainty and becomes universality, but it it is only a sensuous universality. My meaning is vanished, and perception takes the object as it, as it is in itself, or as a universal as such. Singular being, therefore, emerges in the object as true singleness, as the in itself of the one, or as a reflectedness into itself. But this is still a conditioned being for self, alongside which appears another being for, for self. The universality, which is opposed to and conditioned by singular being, but these two contradictory extremes were not merely alongside each other, but in a single unity, or in other words, the defining characteristic common to both, viz. being for self, is burdened with opposition generally, i.e., it is at the same time not a being for self. The sophistry of perception seeks to save these moments from their contradiction, and it seeks to lay hold on the truth by distinguishing between the aspects, by sticking all to the also and to the insofar, and finally, by distinguishing the unessential aspect from an essence which is opposed to it. But these ex expedients, instead of warding off deception in the process of apprehension, prove themselves, on the contrary, to be quite empty. And the truth, which is supposed to be won by this logic of the perceptual process, proves to be in one and the same the respect, the same respect, the opposite of itself, and thus to have as its essence a universality which is devoid of distinctions and determinations. 131. These empty abstractions of a singleness and a universality opposed to it and, in, and of an essence that is linked with something unessential, a non-essential aspect which is necessary all the same. These are powers whose interplay is the perceptual understanding often called sound common sense, this sound common sense, which takes itself to be a solid, realistic consciousness, is, in the perceptual process, only the play of these abstractions. Generally, it is always at its poorest, where uh, it fancies itself to be the richest, bandied about by these vacuous essences, thrown into the arms first of one and then of the other, and striving by its sophistry to hold fast and affirm alternately uh, first one of the essences and then the directly opposite one. Hold on, pause. I'm going to listen to some Mass Effect music. 
As a matter of fact, philosophy does have to do with them too, recognizing them as the pure essences, the absolute elements and powers, but in doing so, recognizes them in their specific determinateness as well and is therefore master over them, whereas perceptual understanding or sound common sense takes them for the truth and is led on by them from one error to another, it does not itself become conscious, that is, it is simple essentialities of this kind that holds sway over it, but fancies that it has always to do with wholly substantial material and content, just as the just as sense certainty is unaware that the empty abstraction of pure being is its essence, but it is, in fact, these essentialities within which perceptual understanding runs to and fro through every kind of material and content. They are the, co the cohesive power and mastery over the content, and they alone are what the sensuous is as essence for consciousness, and they are what determines the relations of the sensuous to it. And it is in them that the process of perception and of its truth runs its course. This course, a perceptual alteration of determining what is true, and then setting aside this determining, constitutes, strictly speaking, the steady everyday life and activity of perceptual consciousness, a consciousness which fancies itself to be moving in the realm of truth. It advances uninterruptedly to the outcome in which all these essential essentialities or determinations are equally set aside. But in each single moment, it is conscious only of this one determinateness as the truth. And then in turn, as the op of the opposite one, it does indeed suspect their unessentiality and sa to save them from the danger threatening them it resorts to the sophistry of asserting to be true what it has itself declared to be untrue. What the nature of these untrue essences is really trying to get perceptual understanding to do is to bring together and thereby supersede the thoughts of those non-entities, uh, the thoughts of that universality and the singular being of also and one of the essentiality that is necessarily linked to the unessential moment and of an unessential moment that yet is un, that yet is necessary. But the understanding struggles to avoid doing this by resorting to insofar as and to the various aspects or by making itself responsible for one thought in order to keep the other one isolated as the true one. But the very nature of these abstractions brings them together of their own accord. It is sound common sense that is prey of these abstractions which spin it round and round in their whirling circle. When common sense tries to make them true by at one time making itself responsible for their untruth, while at another time it calls their deceptiveness a semblance of the unreliability of things and separates what is essential from what is necessary to them, yet supposedly unessential, holding the former to be their truth, as against the latter. When it does this, it does not secure them their truth, but convicts itself of untruth. 3. Force in the understanding, appearance and the supersensible world. 132. In the dialectic of sense certainty, seeing and hearing have been lost to consciousness. And as perception, consciousness has arrived at thoughts, which it brings together for the first time in the unconditioned universal. This now, if it were taken as an inner simple essence, would, would itself in turn be nothing else than one-sided extreme of being for self, for it would then be confronted by non-essence. But if it were related to this, it would itself be unessential, and consciousness would not have escaped from the deceptions of the perceptual process. However, this universal has proved to be one which has returned into itself out of such a conditioned being for self. This unconditioned universal, which is now the true object of the consciousness, is still just an object for it. Consciousness has not yet grasped the notion of the unconditioned as notion. It is essential to distinguish the two. For consciousness, the object has returned into itself from its relation to another and has yet become notion and principle. 
but consciousness is not yet for itself the notion and consequently does not recognize itself in that reflected object. For us, this object has developed through the movements of consciousness in such a way that consciousness is evolved in that development and the reflection is the same on both sides, <clears throat> or there is only one reflection. But since in this movement, consciousness has for its content merely uh, the objective essence and not consciousness as such, the results must have an objective significance for consciousness. Consciousness still shrinks away from what has emerged and takes it as the essence in the objective sense. 133. With this, the understanding has indeed superseded, it, superseded its own untruth and the untruth of the object. What has emerged for it as a result of the notion of the true, not only as the implicit being of the true, which is not yet notion, or which lacks the be, uh, being for itself, or consciousness, in which the understanding without knowing itself therein, let's go its own way. This truth follows out its own essence so that consciousness plays no part in its free realization, but merely looks on and simply apprehends it. To begin with, therefore, we must step into its place and be the notion which develops and fills out what is contained in the result. It is through awareness of this completely developed object which presents itself to consciousness as something that immediately is, that consciousness first becomes explicitly a consciousness that comprehends its object. 134. The result was the unconditioned universal initially in the negative and abstract sense that consciousness negated its one-sided notions and abstracted them. In other words, it gave them up. But the result has implicitly a positive significance in it. The unity of being for self and being for another is posited. In other words, the absolute antithesis is posited as a self-identical essence. At first sight, this seems to concern only the form of the moments in reciprocal relation, but being for self and being for another are the content itself as well. Since the antithesis is its truth, and uh, since its truth can have no other nature than the one yielded in the result, viz. that the content taken in perception to be true belongs in fact only to the form, in the unity of which it is dissolved. This content is likewise universal. There could be no other content which by its particular constitution would fail to fall within the unconditioned universality. A content of this kind would be some particular way or other of being for itself and of being in relation to another. But, general, but in general, to be for itself and to be in relation to another constitutes the nature and essence of the constant whose truth consists in its being unconditionally universal and the result is simply the solely universal and solely universal 135 but because this unconditioned universal is an object for consciousness where emerge there emerges in its distinction of form and content and in the shape of content the, the moments look like they did when they first presented themselves on one side, a universal medium of many subsistent matters, and on the other side, a one reflected into itself, in which their independence is extinguished. The former is the dissolution of the thing's independence, i.e., the passivity that is a being for another. The latter is being for itself, being for self. We have to see how these moments exhibit themselves in the unconditioned universality which is their essence. It is clear at the outset that since they exist only in this universality, they are no longer separated from one another at all, but are in themselves essentially self-superseding aspects, and what is posited in only their transition into one another. 136. One moment, then, appears as the essence that has stepped to one side as a universal medium, or as the subsistence of independent matters. But the independence of these matters is nothing else than this medium. In other words, <clears throat> the unconditioned universal is simply and solely the plurality of the diverse universals of this kind. That within itself, the universal is undivided unity with this plurality means, however, that these matters are each where the other is. The, mutua the mutually... Uh, 
They mutually interpenetrate, but without coming into contact with one another, because conversely, the many diverse matters are equally independent. This also means that they are absolutely porous or are sublated. This sublation in its turn, this reduction of the uh, diversity to a pure being for self is nothing other than the medium itself. And this is the independence of the, indifferent, uh, the indifferent matters. In other words, the matters posited as independent directly passes over into the, their unity and their unity directly unfolds its diversity. And this once again reduces itself to unity. But this movement is what is called force. One of its moments, the dispersal of the independent matters in their immediate being is the expression of force. But force taken as that in which they have disappeared is force proper force which has been driven back into itself from its expression first however the force which is driven back into itself must express itself and secondly it is still force remaining within itself and the expression just as much as it, as it is expression in the self-containedness When we thus preserve the two moments in their immediate unity, the understanding to which the notion of force belongs is strictly speaking the notion which sustains the different moments qua different for themselves, for, for in themselves, they are not supposed to be different. Consequently, the difference exists only in thought. That is to say, what has been posited in the foregoing is in the first instance, only the notion of force, not its reality. In point of fact, however, force is the unconditioned universal, which is equally in its own self uh, what is what it is for another, or which contains the difference in its own self, for difference is nothing else than being for another. In order, then, that force may be in truth, be, may in truth be it must be completely set free from thought. It must be posited as the substance of these differences, i.e., first the substance as this whole force remaining essentially in and for itself, and then its differences as possessing substantial being or as moments existing on their own account. Force as such, or as driven back into itself, thus exists on its own account as an exclusive one for which the unfolding of the different matters is another subsisting essence. And thus two distinct independent aspects are set up, but force is also the whole, i.e. it remains what, it, uh, what is according to its notion. That is to say, these differences remain pure forms, superficial vanishing moments. At the same time, there would be no difference at all between force proper which has been driven back into itself and force unfolding into independent matters. If they had no enduring being or there would be no force if it did not exist in these opposite ways, but that it did, but that it, but that it does exist in these opposite ways simply means that two moments are at the same time. It's at themselves independent. It is therefore this movement of the two moments in which they perpetually give themselves independence and then supersede themselves again, which we are now to consider. In general, it is clear that this movement is nothing else than the movement of perceiving in which the two sides, the percipient and what is perceived are indistinguishably, indistinguishably one, in the, one in the apprehension of the true. And yet each side is at the same time equally reflected into itself or has a being of its own. Here, these two sides are moments of force. They are just as much in a unity as this unity, which appears as the middle term over against the independent extremes, is a perpetual diremption of itself into just these extremes, which exist only through this process. Thus the movement which previously displayed itself as the self-destruction of contradictory notions here has objective form and is the movement of force, the outcome of which is the unconditioned universal as something not objective or as the inner being of things. 
137. Force is thus determined since it is not conceived as force or as reflected in this itself is one side of its notion, but posited as a substantial extreme and moreover with the express character of a one. The subsistence of the unfolded matters outside of force is thus precluded and is something other than force. Since it is necessary that force itself is uh, or be the subsistence or that it express itself, its expression presents itself in this wise uh, that the others or that said the other ah, that said other approaches it and solicits it. But as a matter of fact, since its expression is necessary, what is posited as another essence is in force itself. We must retract the assertion that force is posited as a one and that is its essence uh, and that its essence is to force is, ah, is to express itself as an other which approaches at, at, ah, gosh, dang it, which approaches it externally, forces rather itself this universal medium in which the moment subsists as matters, or in other words, forces expressed itself and what was supposed to be something else soliciting it is really force itself. It exists therefore now as the medium of the unfolded matters, but equally essentially it has the form of the super, supersession of the subsisting matters, or is essentially a one. <clears throat> okay. Um, consequently, this oneness, since force is posited as the medium of the matters, is now something other than force, which has its essence which has this its essence outside of it. But since force must of necessity be oneness, which it is not as yet posited as being, this other approaches it, soliciting it to reflect itself into itself. In other words, force supersedes its expression, expression but in fact, force is itself this reflected oneness, sorry, this reflectedness into self, or this supersession of the expression the oneness is the form in which it appeared, viz. as an other vanishes, force is this other self, is force that is driven back into itself. 138. What appears is another and solicits force both to expression and to a return into itself directly proves to be itself force, for the other shows itself to be as much a universal medium as a one, and in such a way that each of these forms at the same time appears only as a vanishing moment. Consequently, force in that there is an other for it, and it is for an other, has not yet altogether emerged from its notion. There are at the same time two forces present. The notion of both is no doubt the same, and it has gone forth from its unity into a duality. Instead of the antithesis remaining entirely and essentially only a moment, it seems by its self deremption into two wholly independent forces to have withdrawn from the controlling unity. We, now, we have now to see more closely the implications of this independence. In the first place, the second force appears as the one that solicits and moreover in accordance with its co content as the universal medium in relation to the force characterized as the one solicited. But since the second force is essentially an alternation of these two moments and is itself force, it is likewise the universal medium only though it's being solicited to be such. And similarly too, it is a negative unity, i.e. it solicits the retraction of force into itself only through it's being solicited to do so. <clears throat> Consequently, this distinction, too, which obtains between the two forces, one of which was supposed to be the soliciting, the other is solic the solicited, force is transformed into the same reciprocal interchange of the determinateness. 139. The interplay of the two forces thus consists in their being determined as mutually opposed, in their being for one another in this determination, and in the absolute immediate alteration of the determinations, can, uh, well, 
consists, i.e., in a transition through which alone these determinations are in which the forces seem to be making an independent appearance. The soliciting force, e.g., is posited as a universal medium, and the one solicited, on the other hand, as force driven back into itself. But the former is a universal medium only through the other being force that is driven back into itself, or it is really the latter that is soliciting force for the other and is what makes it a medium. The first force has its determinateness only through the other and solicits only insofar as the other solicits it to be a soliciting force. And just as directly, it loses the determinateness given to it, for this passes over, or rather, has already passed over to the other. The external soliciting force appears as a universal medium, but only through its having been solicited by the other force to do so. But this means that the latter gives it that character and is really itself essentially a universal medium. It gives the soliciting force this character just because this other determination is essential to it, i.e. because this is really its own self. 140. To complete our insight into the notion of this moment, it may, be further, it, it may further be noticed that the differences themselves are exhibited in a twofold difference. Once, as a difference of content, <clears throat> one being extreme, the force, uh, one extreme being the force reflected into itself, but the other, the medium of the matters, and again, as a difference of form. Since one solicits and the other one, and the other is solicited, the former being active and the other passive, according to the difference of, its, of content, they are distinguished merely in principle or for us, but according to the difference of form, they are independent and in their relation keep themselves separate and opposed to one another. The fact that the extremes from the standpoint of both these sides are thus nothing in themselves and that these sides in which their differing essences were supposed to consist or only vanishing moments are an immediate transition in each of each into its opposite. This truth becomes apparent to consciousness and its perception of the movement of force. But for us, as remarked above, something more was apparent, viz. that the differences, qua differences of content and form, vanished in themselves, and on the side of form, the essence of the active, soliciting, or independent side was the same as that which, on the side of content, presented itself as force driven back into itself. The side which was passive, which was solicited, or for another, was from the side of form the same as that which, from the side of content, presented itself as the universal medium of the many matters. <clears throat> from this we see, uh, so 141, from this we see that the notion of force becomes actual through its duplication into two forces, and how it comes to be so. These two forces exist as independent essences, but their existence is a movement of each other, or each towards the other, that their being is rather a pure positiveness, or a being that is posited by another, i.e., their being is really the significance of a sheer vanishing. They do not exist as extremes, which retain from, for themselves uh, something fixed and substantial in transmitting to one another in their middle term and in their contact a merely external property of the contrary. On the contrary, what, what they are, they are. Only in this middle term and in this context, in this there is immediately present both the repression within itself of force or its being for self, as well as its expression, force that solicits and force that is solicited. Consequently, these moments are not divided into two independent extremes, offering each other only an opposite extreme. Their essence rather consists simply and solely on this, that each is solely through the other, and what each thus is, it immediately no longer is, since it is with the other. They have thus, in fact, no substances of their own, which might support and maintain them. The notion of force, rather, preserves itself as the essence 
in this very actuality. Force as actual exists simply and solely in its expression, which at the same time is nothing else than a supersession of itself. This actual force, uh, when thought of as free from its expression and as being for itself, is force driven back into itself. But in fact, this determinate, determinateness, as we have found, is itself only a moment of force's expression. Thus the truth of force remains only the thought of it. The moments of its actuality, their substances and their movement, collapse unresistingly in an, into an undifferentiated unity, a unity <clears throat> which is not force-driven back into itself. <clears throat> For this is itself only such a moment, but it is notion qua notion, thus the realization of force is at the same time the loss of reality. In that realization, it has uh, really become something quite different, viz. this universality, which the understanding knows as at the outset or immediately to be its essence and which also proves itself to be such in the supposed reality of force, in the actual substances. 142. Insofar as we regard the first universal as the understanding's notion in which force is not yet for itself, the second is now force's essence as it exhibits itself in and for itself. Or conversely, if we regard the first universal as the immediate, which was supposed to be an actual object for consciousness, then the second is determined as the, neg the negative of force that is objective to sense. It is force in the form of its tr a true essence in which it exists only as an object for the understanding. The first universal would be force driven back into itself, or force as substance. The second, however, is the inner being of things qua inner, which is the same as the notion of force qua notion. One forty-three. This true essence of things has now the character of not being immediately for consciousness. On the contrary, consciousness has a mediated relation to the inner being and, as the understanding, looks through this mediating play of forces into the true background of things. The middle term which unites the two extremes, the understanding and the inner world, is the developed being of force, which for the understanding itself is henceforth only a vanishing. This being is therefore called appearance, for we call being that is directly and in its own self a non-being a surface show. But it is not merely a surface show, <clears throat> it is appearance, a totality of show. This totality, is totality or as a universal, is what constitutes the inner of things. The play of forces as a reflection of the inner into itself, in it, the things of perception are expressly present uh, for consciousness as they are in, it, in themselves, viz. as moments, which immediately and without rest or stay turn into their opposite. <clears throat> the one immediately into the universal, the, assen the essentially immediate, immediately into the unessential, and vice versa. <clears throat> this play of forces is consequently the developed negative, but its truth is the positive, viz., the universal, the object that in itself possesses being, the being of this object for consciousness is mediated by the movement of appearance in which the being of perception and the sensuously objective in general has a merely negative significance. Uh, consciousness, therefore, reflects itself out of this movement back into itself as the true, but qua consciousness converts this truth again into an objective inner and distinguishes this reflection of things from its own reflection into it itself, just as the movement of mediation is likewise still objective for it. This inner is, therefore, consciousness an extreme over it, for consciousness an extreme over against it. But this is for consciousness the true, since it is in the inner, as the inner itself, it po uh, possesses, at the same time, the certainty of itself, or the moment of its being, 
for all self. But it is not yet conscious of this ground or basis for the being for self, which the inner was supposed to possess in its own self, would be nothing else but the negative movement. This, however, is for consciousness. Still, the objective vanishing appearance, not yet in its not yet its own being for self, consequently the inner is for it certainly notion, but this is not as of uh, as yet. Uh, know the nature of the truth. 144. Within this inner truth as the absolute universal, which has been purged of the antithesis between the universal and the individual, has become the object of the understanding. There now opens up this sensuous world, which is the world of appearance, a super sensible world, which henceforth is the true world above the vanishing present world where uh, there opens up a permanent beyond and in itself which is the first and therefore imperfect appearance of reason or only the pure element in which the truth has its essence 145 our object is thus from now on the syllogism which has for its extremes the inner being of things and the understanding and for its middle term appearance but the movement of this syllogism yields the further determination of what the understanding decry, uh, descries in this inner world uh, through the middle term and the experience from which understanding learns about the closed link unity of these terms. 146. The inner world for consciousness is still a pure beyond because consciousness does not as yet find itself in it. It is empty for it is merely the nothingness of appearance and positively the simply the simple or unitary universal. This mode of the inner being of things finds ready acceptance by those who say that the inner being of things is unknowable. But another reason for this would have been would have to be given. Certainly we have no knowledge of this inner world as it is here in its immediacy, but not because reason is too short sighted or is limited, or however else one likes to call it. On this point, we know nothing as yet because we have not yet gone deep enough, but because of the simple nature of the matter in hand. That is to say, because in the void nothing is known or expressed from the other side. <clears throat> Just because this inner world is determined as the beyond of consciousness, the result is, of course, the same if a blind man is placed amid the wealth of supersensible world. If it has such wealth, whether it be his own peculiar content or whether consciousness itself be this, this, this content, and if one with sight is placed in pure darkness or if you like in pure light, just supposing the supersensible world to be this, the man with sight sees as little in that pure light as in pure darkness and just as much as the blind man and the abundant wealth which lies before him if no further significance attached to the inner world and to our close link with it through the world of appearance, then nothing would be left to us but to stop at the world of appearance, i.e., to perceive something is true which we know it is not true. Or in order that there may be yet something in the void which though at first it first came about as devoid as object of objective things, must, however, as empty in itself, be taken as also void of all spiritual relationships and distinctions of consciousness, qua consciousness, in order then that in this complete void, which is even called the Holy of Holies, there may be yet of the there may yet be something. We must fill it up with reveries, appearances produced by consciousness itself. They would have to be content with being treated so badly for it would not deserve anything better, since even reveries are better than its own emptiness. 147. The inner world or supersensible beyond, sorry, one, yeah, 147. The inner world or supersensible beyond has, however, come into being. It comes from the world of appearance, which has mediated it. In other words, appearance is its essence, and in fact, it's filling. The supersensible is the sensuous, and the perceived positive as it is in truth. 
But the truth of the sensuous and the perceived is to be appearance. The supersensible is therefore appearance qua appearance. We completely misunderstand this if we think that the supersensible world is therefore the sensuous world, or of the world as it exists for immediate sense certainty and perception. <clears throat> for the world of appearance is, on the contrary, not the world of sense knowledge and perception as a world that positively is. But this world posited as superseded or as Hmm. <sighs> on. The world perception, the perception is a world that positively is, but the world this world posited is superseded, whereas in truth and in inner world. It is often said that the supersensible world is not appearance. But what is here under but what here but what is here understood by appearance is not appearance, but rather the sensuous world as itself the reality actual. In forty eight. The understanding, which is our object, finds itself in just this position, that the inner world has come into being for it, to begin with, only as the universal still unfilled in itself. The play of forces has merely the negative significance of being in itself nothing, and its only positive significance is that of being mediating a mediating agency, but outside of the understanding. The connection of the understanding with the inner world through the, in, the mediation is, however, its own movement through which the inner world will fill itself out uh, for the understanding. What is immediate for the understanding is the play of forces but what is the true for that? In the simple inner world, the movement of force is therefore the true, likewise, only as something altogether simple. We have seen, however, that this play of forces is so constituted that the force which is solicited by another force is equally the soliciting uh, force for that other, which only thereby becomes itself a soliciting force. What is present in this interplay is likewise merely the immediate alternation or the absolute interchange of the determinateness which constitutes the sole content of what appears to be either a universal medium or a negative unity. It ceases immediately on its appearance in determining form to be what it was on appearing. By appearing in determinate form, it solicits the other side to express itself, i.e., the latter is now immediately what the first was supposed to be. Each of these two sides, the relation of soliciting and the relation of the opposed determinate content is on its own account, an absolute reversal and interchange of the determinateness. But these two relations themselves are again one and the same. And the difference of form of being the solicited and the soliciting force is the same as the difference of content of being the solicited force as such, viz. the passive medium on the one hand and the soliciting force, the active, the negative unity, or the one on the other. In this way, there vanishes completely all the distinction of separate mutually contrasted forces which were supposed to be present in this movement, for they rested solely on those distinctions and the distinctions between the forces along with both those distinctions likewise collapses into only one. Thus there is neither force nor the act of soliciting or being solicited, nor the determinateness of being a stable medium and a unity reflected into itself. There is neither something existing singly by itself, nor are there diverse antitheses. On the contrary, what there is is this absolute flux is only difference as a universal difference or as a difference into which the many antitheses have been resolved. The difference, as the universal difference, is consequently the simple element in the play of force itself, and what is true in it. It is the law of force. 149. The absolute flux of appearance becomes a simple difference through its relation to the simplicity of the inner world, or of the understanding. 
the inner being is, to begin with, only implicitly the, the universal. But this implicit, simple universal is essentially no less absolutely universal difference. For it is the outcome of the flux itself, or the flux is its essence. But is it, it is a flux that is posited in the inner world as it is in truth, and consequently it is received in that inner world as equally as absolute universal difference that is absolutely at the rest and remains its remains self same. In other words, negation is an essential moment of the universal, and negation or mediation of the universal is therefore a universal difference. This difference is expressed in the law, which is the stable image of unstable appearance. Consequently, the supersensible world. Super sensible world is an inter inert realm of laws which, though beyond the perceived world, for this exhibits law only through incessant change, is equally present in it, and it is its direct tranquil image. 150. This realm of laws is indeed the truth for the understanding, and that truth has its content in the law. At the same time, however, this realm is only the initial truth for the understanding and does not fill out the world of appearance. In this, in this the law is present, but, it, but is not the entire presence of appearance. With every change of circumstance, the law has a different actuality. Thus, appearance retains for itself an aspect which is not in the inner world, i.e., appearance is not yet truly posited as appearance, as a superseded being for self. This defect in the law must equally be made manifest in the law itself. What seems to be defective in it is that while it does contain difference, the difference is universal, indeterminate, however, insofar as it is not law in general, but a law, it does not or it does contain determinateness. Consequently, there are indefinitely many laws, but this plurality is itself rather a defect, for it contradicts the principle of the understanding for which, as consciousness of the simple inner world, the true is the implicitly universal unity. It must therefore let the many laws collapse into one law, just as, e.g., the law by which a stone falls and the law by which the heavenly bodies move, have been grasped as one law. But when the laws thus coincide, they lose their specific character. The law becomes more and more superficial and as a result, what is found is in fact not the unity of these specific laws, but a law which leaves out their specific character, just as the one law which combines in itself the laws of falling terrestrial bodies and of the motions of the heavenly bodies, in fact expresses neither law or neither law. The unification of all laws in universal attraction expresses no other content than just the mere notion of law itself which is posited in that law in the form of being. Universal attraction merely asserts that everything has a constant difference in relation to other things. The understanding image imagines that in this unification, it has found a universal law which expresses universal reality as well. But in fact, it has only found the notion of law itself. <clears throat> Comfortable to law. The expression universal extraction, universal attraction, is of great importance insofar as it is directed against the thoughtless way in which everything is pictured as contingent and for which determinate, uh, determinateness has the form of sensuous independence. 151. Thus, in contrast, no specific to specific laws, we had universal attraction or the pure notion of law insofar as this pure notion is looked on as the essence or the true inner being, the determinateness of the specific law itself still belongs to a pure appearance, it, or rather, it's a sensuous being. But the pure notion of law transcends not merely the law, which being itself is a specific law, stands contrasted with the other specific laws, but also transcends law as such. The determinateness of what we spoke is itself really only a vanishing moment 
which can be no longer, or which can no longer occur here as something essential, for here it is only the law that is the true. But the notion of law is turned against law itself. That is to say, in the law, the difference itself is grasped immediately and taken up into the universal, thereby, however, giving the moments whose, real, who, whose relation is expressed by a law of a subsistence in the form of indifferent and nearly implicit essentialities. But these parts of the difference present in the law, are, are present in the law, are at the same time themselves in de, uh, determinate sides. The pure notion of law as universal attraction must, to get its true meaning, be grasped in such a way that in it, in it, as what is absolutely simple or unitary, the differences present in law, are present in law, as such themselves return again into the inner world as a simple entity. This unity is a, the inner necessity of the law. 152. The law is thereby present in a twofold manner, once as law in which the differences are expressed as independent moments, and also in the form of a simple withdrawal into itself, which again can be called force. But in the sense not of force, but that is driven back into itself, but force is such of the, or the notion of force and abstraction, which absorbs the differences themselves of what attracts and what is attracted. In this sense, simple electricity, e.g., is force, but the expression of difference fa falls within the law. But this difference is positive and negative electricity in that case of the motion of falling. Force is the simple factor, gravity, whose law is that the magnitudes of the different moments of the motion, the time elapsed, and the space traversed are related to one another as root and square. Electricity itself is not difference per se, or is not in essence the dual essence of positive and negative electricity. Hence, it is usually said that it has the law of this mode of being, and two, that it has the property of expressing itself in this way. It is true that this property is the essential and sole property of this force, or that it belongs to it necessarily. But necessity here is an empty word. Force must, just because it must, duplicate itself in this way. Of course, given positive electricity, negative two is given in principle, for the positive is only as related to a negative, or the positive is in its own self. <clears throat> the difference from self. And similarly, with the negative, but that electricity as such should divide itself and this way is not in itself a necessity. Electricity is simple force, is indifferent to its law to be po positive and negative, and if we call the former its notion, but the latter its being, then its notion is indifferent to its being. It merely has this property, which just means that this property is not in itself necessary to it. This indifference is given another form when it is said that uh, that to be positive and negative belongs to the definition of electricity and that this is simply its notion and essence. In that case, it is its being would simply mean its actual existence. But that definition does not contain the necessity of its existence. It exists either because we find it, i.e. its existence is not necessary for all, or else it exists through or by means of other forces, i.e., its necessity is an external necessity. But in basing this necessity on the determinateness of being through another, we relapse again into the plurality of specific laws, which we have just left behind in order to consider law as law. It is only the, with law as law that we are to compare its notion as notion, or its necessity. But in all these forms, necessity has shown itself to be only an empty word. 153. There is still another form than just indicated in which the indifference of law and force or of notion and being is to be found. In the law of motion, e.g., it is given that motion be split up into time and space or again into distance and velocity. Thus, since motion is only the relation of these factors, 
it, the universal, is certainly divided in its own self. But now these parts, time and space, or distance and velocity, do not in themselves express this origin in a one. They are indifferent to one another. Space is thought of as able to be without time, time without space and distance, at least without velocity. Just as their magnitudes are indifferent to one another, since they are not related to one another as positive and negative, and thus are not related to one another through their own essential nature. Necessi the necessity of the division is thus certainly present here, but not the necessity of the parts as such for one another. But it is just for this reason that the first necessity, too, is itself only a sham, false necessity. For motion is not itself thought of as something simple or as a pure essence, but as already divided. Time and space are in themselves its independent parts or essences, or distance and velocity are modes of being or ways of thinking, either with which uh, can well be, be without the other, and the motion is, therefore, only their superficial relation, not their essence. If it is thought of as simply essence or as force, motion is no doubt gravity, but this does not contain these differences at all. 154. The difference, then, in both cases is not a difference in its own self, either the universal force is indifferent to the division which is the law, or the difference, the differences, the parts, or the law, are indifferent to one another. The understanding, however, has the notion of this implicit difference just because the law is on the one hand the inner implicit being, but is at the same time inwardly differentiated. That is, difference is thus an inner difference that follows from the fact that the law is a simple force or is the notion of a difference and, it, and is therefore a difference belonging to the notion. Uh, hold on. But this inner difference still fails to begin with only within the understanding and is not yet posited in the thing itself. It is therefore only its own necessity that is asserted by the understanding. The difference then is posited by the understanding in such a way that at the same time it is expressly stated that the difference is not a difference belonging to the thing itself. This necessity, which is merely verbal, is thus a recital of the moments constituting the cycle of the necessity. The moments are indeed distinguished, but at the same time, their differences, their difference is expressly said to not be a difference of the thing itself, and consequently is, is, is itself immediately cancelled again. This process is called explanation. A law is enunciated from this. Its implicitly universal element or ground is distinguished as force, but it is said that this difference is no difference. Rather that the ground is constituted exactly the same as the law. A single occurrence of light, lightning, BG, is apprehended as a universal, and this universal is enunciated as the law of electricity. The explanation then condenses the law into force as the essence of the law. Then force, this force then is so constituted that it is expressed opposite the electricity's Opposite electricities appear. All right, I'm going to call that good. I don't remember what page it was. I'll figure it out later.